So I often get uh, asked about brain fidelity because people don't, yeah, not just you, but people don't understand what that means. Um, and maybe I should think of a better term. Um, well, it, I use fidelity in the design process. It's a low fidelity or a high fidelity, right? Yeah. So if it's a prototype with a low fidelity, you just make it with whatever you have. It's quick and dirty and you get it done. Mm -hmm. But low, high fidelity is perfect, everything is precise. So I don't know. It's, it, and it's similar in brain. So, I mean, when we talk about fidelity in brain, we have different measures in brain structure and function that we can measure. So in brain structure, you look at cortical thickness, for example, the neurons on the surface of the brain, the cell bodies, they will stack up and they will thicken as you use the brain more and they will lay down more neurons. And so one of the measures of fidelity is actual cortical thickness where you see like a muscle builds up over time as you use it, you'll see brain tissue build up as you use it. That's a measure of fidelity. White matter, the, the wires that connect up different regions of the brain, um, as you as they become uh, <coughs> tracks to carry information, they'll become more like pipelines, like straws that can carry information through, and there's not leakage out the side, so you don't see information leaking or water leaking is what we're looking at, but information also leaking out the sides. The information will be transmitted from point A to point B without loss of fidelity or loss of information. Biochemically, you'll see higher levels of chemicals in certain regions of the brain and lower levels of chemicals where they should be. So it's, it's actually a measure of brain strength, uh, the ability of the, the brain to, to do work um, that, that is demanded of it at, at very high levels. So it probably is analogous to what we're talking about in, in the design world. So with intelligence, uh, when I was studying intelligence, it was bigger, better, stronger, faster, won the day. All measures of fidelity were better. Cortical thickness in certain regions of the brain, white matter fidelity, or the straws, or the highways that linked up to higher biochemistry, all of that was predictive of higher level of intelligence in a given individual. When we started to study creativity, something very different emerged, and it was surprising. Lower levels of fidelity in certain regions of the brain across the board were predictive of higher creativity, which implies this flexibility that you're talking about. So in certain situations, you can down-regulate the ability of the brain to focus or to um, direct attention on a certain capacity so that it can broaden the spectrum and pull in information from lots of different regions. And that would, that would facilitate or um, strengthen the ability to pull together creative ideas. It's a very different pattern that we were seeing in creativity than we were seeing in intelligence. Lower measures of fidelity, higher creativity, as opposed to intelligence, higher fidelity, higher creativity. So in the same brain, there's the seesaw of back and forth between intellectual capacity, reasoning capacity, and creative capacity, which is really uh, surprising to us. So you guys get the special privilege of getting kind of, I have a lot of information to convey tomorrow in my talk and it might not all fit together in a logical linear way. So you get, I get to fit all the pieces together for you. So I'm going to be talking to get about two major networks of the brain. Again, it's, there's two types of people in the world and the two major networks are the default mode network and the cognitive control network. So. The default mode, let's just talk about the default mode network. The default mode network is what you do when you're daydreaming, when you're thinking about your relationships, when you're kind of simulating what you might say to someone that you just met. It's like, well, I can say this to them, I can say that to them. It's the workspace of your brain that allows you to try things out and to visualize problem solving before you actually put it out into the wet world of uh, the here and now, where the costs are very high. Visual spatial reasoning is extremely important uh, to that process. And um, we are actively measuring visual spatial processing to get at that ability to be able to pull up ideas in the, mind eye, in the mind's eye 
to be able to do problem solving in the mind's eye, to be able to do mental simulation in the mind's eye, because that is the other half of the coin. Problem solving out in the real world is very important, and that's what most of you guys do in the classroom, is solving problems with the cognitive control network. But I think, and I would uh, task you, or encourage you, or uh, induce you if I could, <laughs> to think about that other world where the kids are daydreaming, where the kids are thinking about something else, where the kids are visualizing problem solving before they try something out in the real wet world of problem solving. A wicked problem is, I think, um, one that um, doesn't have a definitive endpoint. It doesn't have a definitive answer. It doesn't have, um, you know, that cause-effect relationship. This is the way I think about it. So it has a it has a definition on Wikipedia. Wikipedia, if you, if you want to refer, um, look up. But when I think of a wicked problem, it's one that really requires creative problem solving, uh, as opposed to that deductive reasoning process, it, it requires inductive or abductive, iterative process where you throw ideas at it, um, you're trying lots of different ideas, and it's an iterative process until you get to something that's a close approximation to a solution as opposed to a, a, a one-shot deal. Awesome. If we're faced with a dilemma, we're faced with some kind of adversity or challenge, what goes on in our, our mind that says, all right, bring it on. I can do this. It's hard, but you know, I can do this. And sometimes we just want to get the heck out of it. So if, what, what, how do we make that decision? If I knew the answer to that, I wouldn't be sitting here next to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how to take that, sir. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's kind of the million dollar question. I mean, um, I'm glad I waited to the last <laughs> day. To, you know, I've got others here. I mean, that really is the million dollar question. What is going on in your mind to, to trip that trigger? And this is where I start to really back off as a scientist and say, we don't really know. I mean, we have some clues about what might be going on and, you know, the salience network, which allows you to pay attention to some things as opposed to others, and your amygdala lights up, and the anterior cingulate, and this and that, and it's like, but you know, as far as being able to predict that in a high fidelity way for you or for me, um, that's really hard to say. I've studied intelligence, I've studied creativity, I've done some research in talent. The intersection of intelligence, creativity, and talent is genius. And so, um, uh, no one's done a neuro, no one has ever done a neuroscientific study of genius. And so I like to talk about um, uh, the near genius that we all experience, like you've experienced. It's like, wow, that's a great idea if I just only had more coffee. Um, so I think <laughs> this, this bell shaped curve is important that we, we work with gifted people, we work with very talented people, we work with intelligent people. Intelligence is not synonymous with genius, creativity is not synonymous talent is not, but some sort of combination of these three, and environmental issues of course, personality variables, grit, determination, persistence, is going to show us something about genius. And these geniuses are not so separate from us that we can't learn from them and try to uh, increase the likelihood that this exquisitely adept problem solving would happen more often than it is. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Yeah. It was awesome. It was fun. Thanks. Thanks for paying attention and <laughs> letting me keep you hostage for a few minutes after.